Well, hello and welcome. This is Advanced Database uh, 5285. It's a second semester of graduate level database and I'm glad to have you here and welcome to this class. Uh, what I'm going to cover today is basically the syllabus and what we're going a little bit of an overview. Next time we're going to get into more of an overview of what's going to go on in the class. But this is kind of all the required stuff that you have to do at the beginning, which is the syllabus, how the grading works, what you can expect out of this class. Now, at a certain high level, there are a number of different databases and database trends. The big trend in the past few years has been for a thing called NoSQL. And NoSQL, we're going to look very specifically at a database called MongoDB. MongoDB is the most in-demand NoSQL database out there. There is a second one that we may actually also use in this class before we're done called Redis. And Redis is sort of a database, but mostly Redis is a data structure that's shared in memory on a single set of computers. So it's kind of not a database, too. Redis is useful for all sorts of things besides what a database traditionally would be used for. I use Redis for caching in a lot of different ways. But on the flip side of this, we're going to take a close look at SQL, primarily using Postgres. Postgres, uh, MySQL, and MongoDB are three-fourths of the in-demand skills for database. And we're going to delve into performance tuning in SQL and Postgres. Now, that's kind of the, this is what we're doing. There's the how we're going to go about doing that, which is what we're going to cover in the next lecture. But that's kind of the subject area that we're going to be hitting on. Now, these things are, are, you know, it's important, and the big thing that we're going to take away from this is how to make SQL faster. I don't think we're going to take away from this a lot of tuning. There is not a lot of tuning in something like MongoDB. It just is what it is, and you can't really tune it. You can scale it up with more computers, but there is no tuning and there are no options. So who am I? I'm Philip Schlump, professor in, of practice here. My background for doing databases is I built a venture-funded startup company called AutoDBA in which we automated the process of doing two things, storage management and tuning of queries. And those two things for a database at the time 20 years ago were the primary things that database administrators did and Oracle, which is the world's largest database vendor, was just getting to the point where it was having a system set up for uh, automating the process of doing backups. Today, their recovery manager is very mature. There are reasons why we are using Postgres instead of MySQL. Now, I'm going to refer you in the reading to an article that has this kind of a diagram in it, but I'll draw you a quick pie chart of roughly what it shows is that if you take 50% of this, you'll find that these are kind of the breakdowns percentage-wise. There is MySQL, there is Mongo, there is Postgres, and there is Redis. And then there is all the other little pieces up here. And these two, MySQL and Mongo, represent close to 50%. Postgres is the next, next biggest. And we're going to be working over here in this section. The reason for that is really because what you learn about Postgres here also applies to MySQL. MySQL has an open source version called MariaDB. 
And the reason that there is an open source version with a different name from MySQL and a proprietary version of MySQL is because Oracle bought MySQL some years ago. I spent um, a big part of my career being a Oracle database consultant, Oracle DBA. And I have a lot of experience with the Oracle Corporation. And basically, although it is very profitable and you can get good jobs doing it, if I had a choice, I wouldn't touch anything the Oracle Corporation uses or develops or works on. Now, since Oracle bought MySQL, and this isn't the first database that they've purchased, this is many down the road, they have basically gotten rid of all development on it. There's very little changes, no development happening. So if you want something that is being currently developed, you're going to use MariaDB, which has a much smaller developer community than it used to, or you're going to go to something like Postgres. Postgres is very actively being developed and having new features added to it. So to what I mean by no development, uh, 20 years ago, Oracle added timestamps to its database. And there was no conversion between timestamps and dates. And you would think in a database, if you had timestamps, you'd have a way to get to dates and from dates back to timestamps. And there was a defect that I added that said you have to have this conversion to their database of defects. 20 years later, they still haven't addressed that defect. It is still planned and they still haven't fixed it. And there's still no conversion in their database. That's what I mean by no changes. Basically, for strategic business reasons, they just don't make any changes to it anymore. So MySQL, like other products that they've purchased, is going to be in that kind of a world. And that's not where I want to build my future products. So I'm over here in this world with these databases, Redis, Postgres, and Mongo. And I'm going to give you some articles to read on the web, like why to never use Mongo. We're going to talk about that and what some of the disadvantages are in Mongo. But that's kind of the picture. The plan for learning Mongo and Postgres really thoroughly and query tuning is to implement an emulator for Mongo in Postgres. So we're going to tackle that as a project. Now this is a project I've never built before. So, you know, I'm taking some guesses as to how difficult the homeworks are. I could be wrong. This is not, I've built every piece of this and I know this thoroughly and consequently this is a known thing. This is, we're going to build this project together and if something is turning out to be a lot harder than you would expect, that's okay. You're going to get more points for it or it's going to take longer and we're going to adapt the schedule as we go. But after we get done building an emulator, which I actually think is going to be a fairly straightforward project, where they're going to turn to monitoring of Postgres, looking at the queries in it, and figuring out how to tune those queries automatically. That will be somewhere later in the semester. And that's the reason for Python and TensorFlow, is because when I build a company, what we did is automatic query tuning using machine learning. And TensorFlow would be ideal for this. There's still no product out there in the marketplace that does this. In fact, in one of the papers for the reading for the next couple weeks, um, it mentions the fact that Google, with their tremendous effort in building Spanner and the F1 database, hasn't really looked at query performance tuning yet, even though this is an amazing product. Now, one of the interesting features of building an emulator is that although we're targeting Postgres as the back end, we could just as easily take that emulator and target um, the SQL Spanner database that Google runs, and instead of having scalability at the level of, oh, I'm going to do five replicated machines, it's going to have a master failover scenario in Postgres, that what you could do is you could run it on a scalar database where already they have databases running on a million machines, doing 100,000 transactions per second. And suddenly you have a Mongo implementation or Mongo emulator implementation that instead of it scaling to what Mongo will do, will scale to what Google does. So that's the plan. Now, um, office hours. 
I'm going to have office hours Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 8 in the morning. We're going to schedule some other office hours. The way I've done this in the past is I go out and I actually ask the students what's a convenient time for them, and then we find a schedule where I can get some office hours in. But we're going to start with Monday, Wednesday, Friday on Zoom. I will be there for an hour. If there are other students, I do have another class with more students than this in it. If there's somebody else asking questions, be patient. I will get to you. I don't have anything scheduled afterwards, so I can run later in the day. So that's where we are for that. Now, I will also make appointments that I'm expecting to work individually with each one of you. So, you know, that's where I'm going with office hours is we're going to do appointments, we're going to talk one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to work interactively through Zoom, and we're going to learn a lot about how to do remote work and how to build remote database teams. Now, there's some motivation in this remote stuff too. And you look at companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and a whole lot at, at I can't sell it, say it today. Atlassian, okay, have all announced that now that they're remote, they're not going back anytime soon. So lots and lots of companies. In fact, Gartner, who does forecasting for the entire IT industry, has found, talked to uh, CIOs, chief information officers, CTOs, chief financial officers, and found out that 74% of high-tech businesses, now that they are remote, are going to stay remote probably indefinitely. So what we learn about working remotely right now in this class and building remote teams is applicable to what you're going to be doing in the future, most likely, and how to work remotely and what you do. That's an important set of skills as well, and we're going to be working on that. My background in doing remote work is that I worked for a startup some years ago, and they were a remote company, and I helped them set up their remote teams. I spent a year and a half working with them. I did a bunch of development work for them, but the entire set of processes to get in place to be a remote company, I worked that through with them. Onboarding, how you start out, how you communicate, what you have to do. Now, some of this is not going to be as much as in a remote business, but we are going to hit on some of that as as we go through in this class. So we have lectures, we have uh, two tests, this is getting into how we're grading the class, we have a bunch of reading, um, there is a, a file that has a list of reading and I'll have due dates for this, and these are our really class things, and then we have a bunch of homework, which is the project. Now, the tests, the midterm and the final, represent 23% of your semester grade, which means that most of your semester grade comes from the participation and basically the homework, the project, building the stuff. And we may, by the end of the semester, if we can squeeze it in, have you do short 10-minute presentations on part of what you've done in the code. And those are just going to be like a structured walkthrough. They're not going to be a big deal. If we do presentations, we probably will have that instead of a final. But that's yet to be determined. So this is kind of the layout of the class. There is a table on page 5, I think, in the syllabus. I emailed you the syllabus this morning. I think it is page 5 that lists your number of points to get a semester grade. It looks like that. Okay. So look at page 5. Page 4 has the homework. The first couple homeworks are you have some sort of a client out here that is talking across a network to a Mongo server. And when it talks across the network, there is some sort of a wire protocol. We're going to intercept that wire protocol and take a big look at what's going on in that protocol. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. If we capture that wire protocol, then our emulator can sit here and be our Mongo emulator right here from the wire protocol, and the client doesn't have to know that it's had its back end replaced. 
We can also use this wire protocol to do things like determine the timing of how things fast things happen in Mongo and what it returns. So we're going to be delving into what is that wire protocol and how does it work. And that's going to be the first couple homeworks. When we talk about proxies and servers, this is the stuff. Is where is this? How are these things put together? What is that wire protocol? How do we time things? How do we get actual benchmark data from something like this? Because ultimately, that wire protocol and the timing in it determines how long it takes for Mongo to do something. Now, if you looked at Postgres, you'd find that it also has a wire protocol and it has emulators set up in the same sort of way that there are people that have poked into the wire protocol and done stuff with it. And that is a critical spot for you to be able to intercept, change, modify, understand what's going on inside a database. If you want real timing information that isn't like corrupted by other layers like buffer pools and stuff like that, that's the spot to dig into. So that's our first set of a couple homeworks is the protocol and how we dig into that wire protocol. Now, when we get access to this protocol, we also get some other benefits. We can build an automated testing engine because if we've got a client out here and it talks across to a server, but we can actually tap into this and put ourselves in the middle, we can create files with information about what's going on in here. Not only is it good for debugging because you can look at this and say, oh, I see where the problem is. It's not that this is not doing it right, it's that this is not doing it right. We can also use that to take these files now and we can eliminate this guy and we can run them back into here and we can repeatedly test the database server side as well. So there's a whole bunch of testing and automation and utility to getting into that protocol, pulling it apart, finding out what it is, and being able to capture it, save it, replay it, modify it, and we're going to mess around with that kind of stuff too. So there's testing advantages. But one of those pieces is how long it takes, and we get timing information out of it. That's the first set of homeworks, and we're going to be building those in Go. Um, Go is pretty much an ideally suited language for doing that kind of work. It has all sorts of facilities for doing things like building a web proxy, and it has libraries that specifically will allow you to take this, it's JSON in binary called Bison. Okay, no, I did not spell that right. B S O N. Take out the I. B S O N, okay, which is binary JSON, and it has libraries built in that are available that will take this and turn this into text. So it's got libraries in it that make doing this project much easier than other languages. A big part of the reason for that is that they use Go in building MongoDB. So we get access to a bunch of stuff like that, and we can poke around and use it, and we don't have to wonder, how do we reverse engineer their protocol? No, the protocol is all known. There's a protocol document out there and the libraries to access it. So that's our first set of homeworks for this, and where we're going to go with those homeworks. Um, in the syllabus, I think on page 7, it has a list of the lectures. And I will tell you right now that that list of lectures is only a, a preliminary list. It is not a perfect list. We're going to have to see where we end up with stuff in this plan. And I've broken it out by week, not by class, since this is an online class. So roughly speaking, this is my plan. Is we're going to start out with MongoDB and install MongoDB and do some learning on how to use it and what it can do and how it works. Then we're going to go over and we're going to work on Python and we're going to take Python, or not Python, I mean Postgres, we're going to go over to Postgres, we're going to get it installed and we're going to experiment with Postgres and using some indexing and how it supports JSON data. 
After we've gotten kind of both sides, we're going to poke into the protocol more in details and look at that. And then we're going to start working on our emulator. So our first few weeks are kind of the background to this and how it works. Now, I have a, do, I have a list of reading for you to do. There's journal articles, primarily having to do with um, Google's Spanner and F1 databases. And what Google did is they went out and looked at a whole bunch of code. And we're going to get into more details on this in the first lecture, but they went out and looked at a bunch of their code to find out how effective are these NoSQL databases. And there is the mantra that, you know, if you want scalability, you have to do NoSQL. And there are these two concepts. There is an article that describes them in detail, but you need to know what they are. One is called ACID. Okay, and I will get you the original article on this to read, but this one I'm pointing you at a web page gives a nice discussion without getting into all the technical details. And the other is called BASIC. And Postgres does ACID compliance. This is hard. BASIC is what Mongo does. And MongoDB because it does basic, is in some ways faster because it doesn't have to do this hard stuff for ACID compliance. But it turns out that most applications actually need not just ACID compliance, they need a decent query language. And you can argue whether or not what Mongo provides is a decent query language, but it turns out that in most applications, the way they got a decent query language is they tacked it on top of whatever their underlying NoSQL database was, and they wrote their own custom query processor. So you've moved this common piece of code that could be tested and verified and checked up into the application layer. And they also ended up moving some sort of synchronization to overcome the deficiencies in the concurrency controls of basic concurrency controls. So between those two things, they took some hard code that could be shared and they moved it out into the application where it had a lot of problems. And they kept finding defects out there in the application land. So Google finally said, you know what, we're going to take a serious look at this and see if we can't get back to doing SQL queries in an ACID compliant database with all the advantages of a NoSQL database. And that's where Spanner and F1 come from. And their results tend to indicate that, yes, it is doable. Since they've done that, there is now a Postgres distributed implementation, open source, of the same thing, called CockroachDB. I don't love the name, but I do love the database. It is a fully distributed, high-performance Postgres implementation that doesn't give you everything in Postgres, but gives you Postgres SQL, it doesn't have things like the ability to plug foreign language packs into it, okay? And things like that, not foreign English language, but you can't write stored procedures in other languages in it. But it gives you most of what you want for a distributed high performance database. Now, Google's description of their F1 database, their SQL database sitting on top of Spanner, is that it is the world's first world-scale database. It is big enough that if you use um, Google's monitor, security monitoring tools, they have a security monitoring for monitoring their stuff and that you can also use it as well. The way that it sends video frames through and distributes those around the world is by storing the video frames in the database. The database synchronizes it and distributes it real-time video through a database, something that nobody else could do. Now, to do this, Google did an amazing thing. They have a time management system, and their time management system involves them actually building and testing atomic clocks in each of their data centers so that they can have accurate, picosecond accurate timing in each database system around the world that is consistent. Now, back in 1914, um, Einstein published a paper on general relativity. And um, most people don't realize that's not what he got his Nobel Prize for. 
but his general relativity paper, you know, would be tested and found, sure looks like this is the way the universe actually works, is general relativity. But, you know, in terms of being a practical application, what are we going to do with it? Uh, it's there, but what do we use it for? I mean, his other paper that he got a Nobel Prize for had to do with uh, picking up light and photosensors. And he got the Nobel for that. Uh, but the general relativity, even though it is an amazing thing that he published, well, what are we going to use it for? And the first commercial application for general relativity, you know, we're talking about the curvature of the universe here, is we've got planet Earth out here, and we've got a bunch of satellites, and we want to find our location based on timing signals on the surface. This is called GPS, Global Positioning System. And it turns out that these signals don't come straight across, they follow the curvature of the gravity well that Earth is sitting in. So to calculate out GPS positions correctly, we had to use general relativity. Now, if you didn't take into account the curvature of space-time, you would be off by somewhere between 1 and 2 kilometers whenever you do a measurement, whereas GPS signals are accurate to these days to within 3 centimeters. So between 1 and 2 kilometers and 3 centimeters, that's what difference using general relativity is. And that was the first commercial application of the general theory of relativity, without which this multi-billion dollar industry and things like autopilots for planes and navigation and our cell phones that we use that can tell us where we're at would not work. The second commercial application for general relativity is the Google Timing API. And the reason that Google Time has to use the curvature of the Earth is because across the surface of the Earth, the Earth is not flat. Some things are higher and some things are lower. And the farther you are away from the center of the Earth, that radius changes time. And when you're trying to track time in picosecond quantities and get it accurate, the elevation of your data center around the world affects how time goes by. And consequently, they have to take into effect, into account, general relativity and the curvature of space-time. So this world-scale database and their accurate timing API is the world's second application of research from over a hundred years ago. Theoretical physics. And uh, I just thought I'd throw that in as an anecdotal thing. But yes, we are going to be reading about their database and how it works. It is an amazing thing. And uh, it's one of those common knowledge was that you couldn't build this and it wouldn't work. And they went out and figured it out and based it off of a bunch of research by Leslie Lamport. Um, and we will have that paper in this class as well for you to read uh, on synchronizing concurrent data. In uh, 82 to 89, he did these series of papers. Uh, another one of his papers on data, which is really worth reading, although it's not relevant to this class, is the one where he talks about the Byzantine Generals problem. And that other data synchronization in the Byzantine Generals problem is the basis for blockchains. So, in a few short years, he did that and also invented LaTeX. So, an amazing, amazing set of research that he did and development work that he did in just a few years. So, that's kind of the overview, overview of the class. What's in the syllabus? Grading policy. The rest of the stuff after the schedule is we do have a late work policy. Okay, the rest of the syllabus is the required pieces that the university makes me put in. Most of this you can read. You've seen it before in classes. There is a new section in there on SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 related policies that basically says you have to comply with local laws while on campuses for things like masks. University of Wyoming is requiring masks on campus. I don't think that affects us too much in this class, 
although there is the possibility that some of you may be actually on campus working on this. If you are, let me know. I do want to know that. I would also ask that each of you go into your profiles in the uh, Wild Web and add a picture so that I have a better idea of, you can put in a profile picture, so that I've got a better idea of who it is I'm talking to and who I'm grading. That'll help me in the process. It's not required, but I'd really like it if you put in some sort of a picture of yourself in there. And I'm not going to distribute the pictures to anybody. It's just so that, you know, when I bring up your grades, I see this is the person I'm talking about. This is who I'm dealing with. That helps me. And if there's messages, it shows up in the messages as well. Now, part of this class is probably going to be some amount of discussion. We will schedule that when we're going to have it, and I'll work with your individual schedules. But my suspicion is that since most of the classes are online, the scheduling for that is not going to be too difficult. Now, normally in a regular class, this would take a little bit long because there'd be some questions. But today, I think I've actually covered the material I wanted to in the syllabus and the introduction to the class, and what we're going to do instead is I'm going to contact you individually and see if you've got questions about what's in the class, what's going on, how we're going to approach this, other things like that. One last detail. Okay, We are using Go, which means that if you're not familiar with Go and programming in Go, we're going to have to work through some stuff on that. We'll do that outside of the regular lectures on an individual basis. I do have a PDF of a good book on Go called the, um, oh good heavens, I can't think of the name of it at the moment, but I do have a PDF on it. It's out of print, but the book itself is only about 90 pages. Go is a simple language to learn and an easy language to learn, so that shouldn't be too much of a challenge. Well now, this is an exciting moment as far as I'm concerned. We're starting off on a journey to figure out if we can take a major product and emulate it and replace it with something better and solve a lot of problems. And in the process, hopefully we'll not just do that, but we'll also learn a lot of stuff about how these different things work and interact. All right, until next time.